Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the mayor of Calgary, Nahed Nenshi. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Welcome here. I see that Mother Nature has provided you with a true Canadian welcome. Uh, it is welcome to this beautiful late summer day here in Calgary. I am thrilled, really, to welcome all of you here, here at Stampede Park, where the Bow River meets the Elbow River, in a place where people have been coming for thousands and thousands of years. People have been drawn to this land because of those rivers meeting here, to this place that the Blackfoot people call Mokinstis, the Elbow. Despite the weather today, this is actually a pretty dry region. And people have come here because of the water, because of the life-giving qualities of that water. So if you think about it, in biblical times, there were already people on this land. In the times of the great civilizations of the world, there were already people on this land. People came here to hunt and fish and trade, to live, to love, to dance, to drum, to fight sometimes, but above all, to engage in that very human act of building community. And that's what we do here on this land every single day. So let me welcome you first then, in the name of the original inhabitants of this land, Nitsitapi, it just means the people. We call them the Blackfoot people now, the people of the Siksika, the Gaina, and the Pikani nations. In the names of our neighbors, the Beaver people, of the Sutina Nation, the Nakoda people of the Stony Nations, in the name of the Métis people with their long history on this land. And I welcome you in the names of all those others who make this place home. For the last 150 years or so, we've always tried on this land. We haven't always succeeded, but we've always tried to be a beacon of light and hope in an often cold and dark and cruel world. To be a place where we have said to people from every corner of this broken earth, come here. You're welcome here. You'll be safe here. Your kids and their kids and their kids will have extraordinary opportunity right here. And that's the spirit in which I get the chance to welcome all of you here today. So welcome. Dada Nastada. Ambawa Stitch. Oki Nitsugwa. As a Muslim, you'd think I'd be able to say that easier. But when you stick it at the end of all those indigenous languages, the languages are different, but the sentiment is the same everywhere. Greetings to our relations. We greet you in peace, and we welcome you here. Now, I understand that in over 90 years, the Society of Petroleum Engineers has been gathering for this annual technical conference. And this is the first time in Calgary. So what took you so long? Obviously, you've come here from all over the world, and many of you have been here before, because, of course, Calgary is the Canadian home, the North American home for energy in all its fronts. And that's one of the reasons why we are so excited to have you all here today. From the first Leduc oil boom to the incredible innovation and technical accomplishments in our energy sector today, this city has benefited from the work of petroleum engineers for more than a century. The SPE is a really extraordinary organization, 155,000 members, 154 countries. I cannot imagine the brains that are in this room today. Those brains that are getting to work on some of the most interesting and difficult problems for humanity today. Here in Calgary, we have a very simple economic development vision, a pretty low bar. And that vision is simply to be Canada's destination of choice for the world's best entrepreneurs solving the world's biggest problems. Whether those are problems in energy, in transportation, in food, in life sciences, we welcome innovation, we welcome ideas, we welcome big brains. I always say, that Calgary is a place where nobody cares what your last name is or what you look like or how you worship or whom you love or where you went to school. 
What we care about is what you bring to the table. We care about your brains, we care about your ideas, we care about innovation, and that's why I am so thrilled to have all of you here with us today. Together with your local members in Calgary, you've created opportunities for the entire world. You've unlocked an unprecedented age in terms of quality of life. I believe that access to safe, clean, reliable energy is the most powerful poverty fighting tool we have. And it's because of the work that you do that we're able to unlock this quality of life. I know I don't need to tell you all about the good that comes from humanity's access to energy. My notes say, but I will anyways. I won't. You know it. But I will tell you that while it's quite literally impossible to imagine what our world would look like today without the contributions of the energy sector, and specifically without the contributions of petroleum engineers and the businesses that fuel their work, I also want to say that we live in a complicated time. We live in a time where concerns about, very well-placed concerns about the environment, about climate, about weather changes, about our very way of life and our ability to sustain not just our quality of life, but life itself have come to the fore. And we live in a world where we can no longer ignore that, where we can no longer be boosters for our own industry while not thinking about the, the need of everything else in the rest of the world. And we have to figure out how to manage that. You know, I was in New York last week for some of the events around the UN General Assembly and the Climate Summit. And I will tell you, if we fail, if we fail in our quest to meld fighting poverty and access to clean, safe, reliable energy and quality of life with stewardship of this planet that we are lucky enough to live on, if we fail, generations to come will never forgive us. So we've got a big job to do. We've got an extraordinarily big job to do. And we have to do that not just with aggressive backlash against the backlash against the industry. We have to do that not just through telling the story of our innovation, to telling the great stories about the Alberta oil patch and how they've reduced greenhouse gas emission intensity in ways that nobody dreamed were possible. We have to do more and we have to do better. We have to be leaders in the transition to a new kind of energy and to a new kind of environment. We have to be leaders in the fight against climate change. The good news is, we're up to it. Those innovations I just talked about in the Alberta energy sector that nobody dreamed of, why did those happen? Because of really smart petroleum engineers. Because of the people in this room. Because we have never, ever in this industry shied away from innovation. We have never, ever in, the, in, in this industry ran away from thinking about better ways to do things. You know, in government, and I'm thrilled to be joined by the former mayor of Calgary, His Worship Al Dewar here, and I think he'll agree with me, in government, sometimes, we get a little bit tied to the way we've always done things. And I know in big oil companies that never happens, right? You never have people say, but we tried that in 1982 and it didn't work. Maybe you do. But we've got to get beyond that. We've got to get into a mindset that says we've got our role to play. We've got our role to play in economic productivity and quality of life and fighting poverty. But we too are human beings who live on this planet and we are going to figure this out together. The polarization that we see in the world, the black and white, you're either for the economy or you're for the environment, isn't the real life that we live in. It's not the life that citizens of the world live in. And that's the work we have to do in order to prove that we can use innovation to help solve the biggest problems of the world. I'm very, 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 very proud of Canadian energy. I'm proud of our sector. I'm proud of the fact that it's headquartered right here in Calgary. I'm proud of the women and men who go to work every single day to provide that energy and to make life better for everyone. And we got to highlight some of the great work that happens. Just this past weekend, Proton Technologies here in Calgary demonstrated a new way to capture hydrogen while traditional oil sands extraction is happening. I have no idea if it actually works. I trust Proton that it does, but this is exactly the kind of innovation that we need to think hard of. We've got to reduce risk, we've got to maximize benefits, that's what this industry has always done. Think back to the very beginning. John D. Rockefeller recognized that the refining of kerosene led to gasoline being created as a byproduct, 
and figured out what to do with it, creating the most important moment in the history of human travel. The science may be over my head, but the work you do never ceases to amaze me. So as your conference unfolds over the next three days, I hope to hear about the next great breakthroughs. I hope to hear from some of the great leaders transforming the industry today and tomorrow. Here in Calgary, we always welcome people to be part of our energy. And there's a double meaning in that. It's not just to be part of the energy sector, but also to be part of the electricity in the air that comes from great people having great ideas in an environment that helps them work and helps make it happen. So while you're here in Calgary, please learn a lot. Take back great ideas. Spend a lot of money while you're here. We're still in an economic downturn and those local businesses will appreciate it. Explore this great city, the wonderful art scene, the food, everything else uh, in this place while you're here and we invite you to be part of our energy. But mostly, I want to say to all of you, thank you for coming, thank you for being here, and most important, thank you for the work that you do every single day, improving quality of life for people everywhere around the world. Thank you all. Please welcome the SPE 2019 president and your host this week, Sammy Alnuaim. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome you to the 2019 annual technical conference and exhibition. We have an exciting week ahead of us with so many opportunities to network, learn, and explore new ideas through the latest EMP innovations. If you have not done so already, please download the ATC 2019 mobile app to assist you throughout the conference. We're very excited to be in Calgary, Alberta, a leading city in responsible energy production. Canada is indeed the fourth largest oil production producing country with 5% of the world production. Canada is the fourth largest oil exporter in the world. And 80% of that oil and gas is produced here in the province of Alberta, an economic engine for growth. Canada's oil and gas industry is active also in addressing the environment across its operations, improving the efficiency of heating for steam-assisted gravity drainage, reducing fugitive emissions, reclaiming sites after use, and so much more. Canada has been a leader in carbon capture and sequestration projects, with several pilots completed projects online and new projects pending activation. Which brings me to the topic of today's opening session, positively impacting the world through responsible energy development. My goal as SPE president has been to start conversations that can change the future of our industry and help maintain our license to operate. I believe our industry is strong and oil and gas will continue to supply more than half of the world's energy needs for many decades to come, even as renewable energy sources grow. Global energy demand continues to rise, yet nearly a billion people on our planet still lack access 
to basic energy. With expected population growth, oil and gas will continue to be needed as part of the overall energy mix. Everyone here who has worked in developing countries has observed how the revenue, jobs, infrastructure our industry brings can indeed transform human lives. The value we provide to society is truly immeasurable. Anyone who has read my JPT columns knows that I am so passionate about increasing awareness on sustainability in oil and gas, reducing carbon emissions, and protecting our environment is indeed vital to the future of our industry as it is difficult to achieve. I have met with hundreds of SPE members who share my passion and are eager to find solutions to these challenges. I can see we are moving in the right direction. I believe all SPE members must be also the stewards for the future of this industry by performing their job with excellence, integrity, and most importantly, the pride, while caring for our community and the environment. Industry leaders, like many here in Alberta, continue to implement best practices to reduce their carbon footprint and place a major emphasis on research and development that support sustainability initiatives. I just returned from a remarkable week in New York City where I participated in the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative CEO Technology Showcase. At that event, 13 major IOCs and NOCs presented their top decarbonization effort and technologies that address the current challenges of climate change. I strongly encourage all oil and gas companies around the world to join this effort and learn from their environmental stewardship strategies. Successfully arresting climate change before the United Nations goal of near zero net CO2 emission by 2050 indeed will require collaboration across many industries such as oil and gas, coal, agriculture, forestry, cement, and steel. Thankfully, many prominent oil and gas companies are already making this issue as top priority. First, there are many critical questions that we must address and answer. How will we balance improving people's lives through hydrocarbon development while maintaining our Earth as we know it today? Which new technologies could help us to be more effective in these efforts? How has our public perception changed? And what must we do to maintain our license to operate? I am very excited to hear how our distinguished panelists address this topic. But first, I would like to share something that makes me hopeful for the future of our industry. People say our industry is dirty and our technology is old. People blame us for climate change. People say we should stop using oil and gas right now. People say they don't want our industry in their backyard. A lot of people living without electricity are in Africa. We can help them. We are needed today and well into the future. People are looking to me. To me. To me. To me. To me. To solve world challenges. How can we do that? Who do we invite to the table? HSE and sustainability. Production engineering. Business analytics. Technology. Reservoir engineer. 
All our industry disciplines touch sustainability in some way. We are all connected in this challenge. And together, we will develop many solutions. Technology is propelling us forward. Using machine learning, we are making wells safer and more productive. That's incredible. We are trying to do more with less by prioritizing digital transformation. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Our drilling is more efficient than ever, and we're accomplishing this by using fewer resources, which reduces our overall carbon footprint. We are minimizing surface usage and using 80% fewer materials than a decade ago. Reducing emissions from operations. Recycling and reusing water. Increasing our energy efficiency. Investing in newer, cleaner technology. Emphasizing safety and environmental protection. Investing $1 billion in carbon capture and storage. Using artificial intelligence and assistive technology to be smarter, faster, better. Our life is filled with things made from oil and gas. It doesn't just power our cars and industries. It fertilizes plants. It's part of medication. Medical devices, cosmetics, sports equipment, phones, and much more. That's amazing. But we need to do more. Imagine if we removed all carbon emissions from oil and gas. If everyone can have clean, safe, affordable energy. Let's set goals to preserve our planet's future. Writing them on a piece of paper won't be enough. I will work to achieve my goals. I will work. I will work. I will work to. To achieve. To achieve. To achieve. To achieve my goals. My goals. My goals. Innovations and new technology. Embracing new ideas. Acceptance. We are at a special moment in time. There are great opportunities in our industry. Our decisions. Our values. Our vision. It matters. I matter. I matter. I matter. I matter. I matter. The world is watching. You better believe I am ready. And me. And me. And me. And me. Bring on the challenge. We are ready. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the ATCE 2019 General Chairperson, President and Chief Executive Officer of Seven Generations Energy, Marty Proctor. Thank you, Sammy. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are thrilled you have joined us in Calgary, Alberta, the epicenter of the Canadian energy industry. Calgary is also home to the University of Calgary, Calgary's largest joint chemical, or Canada's largest joint chemical and petroleum engineering school with world-leading research in petroleum and especially on conventional resource extraction. And it should be noted that Calgary was recently ranked by the Economist Intelligence Unit as the most livable city in Canada and North America. It is my honor to serve as the general chairperson for SPE's annual flagship event, especially because this is the first time in the event's 90 plus year history that it will be hosted on Canadian soil. Over the next three days, you will have opportunities to explore the very latest in ENP technologies, industry best practices, and impressive new product launches. The primary objective of AT ATCE is, and has always been, to accelerate innovation by offering the highest quality technical sessions and specialized training courses in nearly every technical discipline imaginable. Canada holds 10% of the world's oil reserves. The majority are located right here in the province of Alberta. Canada is the world's fifth largest gas producer. Most of our future production will come from unconventional tight plays in Western Canada, particularly the Montney Formation, spanning the Alberta-British Columbia boundary. With this context, our 2019 technical program will place particular emphasis on topics specific to Canadian heavy oil production and unconventional resources. Whatever your discipline, we have the technical presentations to pique your interest. 
and help you generate solutions at your office, in your lab, or in the field. We will also focus on data analytics and ways to maximize their integration into our working world. Big data continues to revolutionize, revolutionize the industry in areas of finding and development, operational efficiency, employee safety, and environmental stewardship, and countless of other ways. The applications for data analytics are endless, and understanding the best ways to put them to use is crucial to how our industry meets society's future needs. You will soon notice there are more than 200 companies occupying the sold-out BMO Center and the exhibition floor. The exhibition is always one of the most exciting and inspiring areas of ATCE. I strongly encourage you to walk the floor and see the latest industry technologies and innovations that are shaping the future of oil and gas. Most importantly, ATCE brings the brightest E&P professionals together from across the globe to share ideas, to network with peers, and recognize members' outstanding accomplishments. If you love, oil, if you love working in oil and gas, or want to learn more about the industry, you have come to the right place. At this time, I would like to recognize and thank all who served on the 2019 Executive Advisory Committee. You have done an outstanding job in putting together our general session this year. Thank you. We will open the conference with a panel discussion on positively impacting the world through responsible energy development. As Sammy said, the world needs energy, and the global demand for energy is only increasing. As an industry that supports more than 50% of that demand, we must evolve, just as the energy professionals did in the generations before us. We provide a service that is vital to human prosperity, but how can we supply it in the most environmentally sustainable way? How can we balance economic growth, social development, and environmental stewardship? Which new technologies could help us? To explore this topic in more detail, I would like to introduce our panel of industry leaders. Thank you for your time today, and enjoy ATCE. Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear industry friends, let me add my very warm welcome to all of you. I'm Ethno Trainer, and it's absolutely wonderful to be back here with you at SPE, the annual technical conference and exhibition 2019, coming to you live from Calgary, chilly Calgary, I'll add too, but how refreshing, it's lovely to be here. Now, it was just a week ago when the industry got another warning that this world is on the edge of catastrophic climate change. In a very loud message from the United Nations, we have been told in no uncertain terms to do more, to do it faster, and this time to make sure that it works. This high-level climate summit saw 60 countries recommit to new climate pledges reinforcing the Paris Climate Agreement from 2015. I say this industry will not fail future generations. It will not be part of the catalyst that will push this world to mass extinction. This industry has been taking action. There have been no empty words. And this industry is upping its game to be part of the solution. Now, climate change is impacting everyone, on a personal level, on a business level. And the industry is watching, and it is policing itself, with serious commitment already in place, and practical leadership delivering on a focused agenda. Now, of course, we must also commend the work of SPE on their strategy on climate change, on their development of a consensus, and on their leadership in forging wider industry ties and discussion. 
Now, we all look to the urgent and essential goal of reducing global emissions by 2030. But I know that everybody wants to do better. Because this industry realizes the value of our future. It values the importance of the planet. And it promises to find the necessary contribution to deliver the solution. I believe this industry is determined to work harder, to work faster, and to deliver on its commitment to climate change. It's determined to reduce emissions, and it has committed to use its knowledge, its technological expertise, and its money to do so. Now, the call for many global leaders, as well as climate activists, is that action is needed right now. And again, I believe the industry is answering that call. But it must do so in parallel to keeping the world supplied with energy, while facilitating economic growth, social development, and environmental stewardship, all of that for the good of future generations. Now, there are some who disregard this multi-tier approach. But there is no alternative right now. And we must meet the growing energy demand. The United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, acknowledged that many business leaders are stepping up to the front and taking action. But he also encouraged more governments have to do more, get the right regulation in place, and adding that green business is good business. Now, the task before all of you is complex, and there are many things that we all need to do. But we must meet this challenge head on, and we need to continue working, and we have to find the solutions. Without a doubt, there have been remarkable advances in low carbon technologies, many of them engineered by existing energy players. And these, of course, are putting emissions reduction in most sectors well within economic reach for many countries and for many companies. There's general consensus that this now transforms a technological challenge into one for society and an economic challenge into a regulatory and an investment one. No one is ignoring the risk of global warming. I believe that message has been heard loud and clear, and I also believe that this industry is responding. You all know that hydrocarbons have fueled our lives and businesses for many decades. Energy has led countries into an industrial age and has delivered a very comfortable life for the majority of the world's citizens. It has enabled food production, health care, construction, transportation, space exploration, entertainment. It has delivered a much better standard of living for billions of people around the world. But we still have a responsibility, and we must still lift millions more from energy poverty so that they, too, can enjoy a different and a better lifestyle. While many look back in blame, this industry must look forward in possibilities. We've developed cleaner fuels, more efficient engines, and we're now at the very forefront of carbon reduction. Many leaders in this industry may be older than those who oppose the world of oil and gas. But that does not mean that they are not paying attention that does not mean that we are not affected. They, too, are serious, and they, too, care. And while the United Nations General Secretary said the climate change race is one we are losing, he also delivered a note of hope and pragmatism. He acknowledged that limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees was still possible but said that it demands a global transformation across all sectors in how we grow food, use land, fuel our transport, and power our economies. 
He talked about the fact that the race is still in progress. And though time is tight, we're all still in the running. But that cannot justify complacency. That cannot justify indecision. And it will not tolerate inaction. I see this industry determined to deliver on its commitment and to reverse the impact of industry emissions. The hydrocarbon industry has stepped up the pace in recent years. It's tackling with speed, with commitment, and with investment. And this urgent appeal we need to realize is within our grasp as this industry has become more aligned. Because as the Secretary General also acknowledged, it is with greater commitment and with better cooperation that this still is a race we all can win. Thank you. Now we've invited key energy producers here to this opening panel, and they are going to outline what they're going to do, their views in terms of what their companies are doing to address and to mitigate climate change, and indeed to positively impact the world through responsible energy development. So please, let me introduce our great panel here to you. The Senior Director for ARC Energy Research Institute, please welcome Jackie Forrest. Great to have you here, Jackie. From Gazprom Neft, we're delighted to have with us the Chief Technology Officer, Andrei Boshkov. The Global VP of Supply Chain for BP is with us, Leanne Russell. And from Baker Fuse, the Executive Energy Transition and Clean Energy Solutions, Jean Maison. So we have a great panel here. Now, just before we begin, I'd like to make sure that you have an opportunity to submit your questions. Um, if you haven't already downloaded the app, I suggest that you actually do so now, perhaps. And of course, you can download the app on the App Store or Google Play and find ATCE 2019. It's pretty straightforward. Um, submit your questions. Let's see from the app dashboard. You have to tap on the orange Q&A button and then select the opening general session. And then click on the green Ask button. And from there, you enter your question. Just click Submit. Now, we will have several questions that you will see to vote for a question that's already been submitted, because some of you might want the same question. Just click the green arrow, and it'll move up the queue and put a bit of pressure on us to make sure that we're paying attention to what's on your mind and that we're actually going to answer that question. But let's begin. We have a lot to get through. And indeed, here we are on this great opening session for ATCE 2019. Jackie, I'd like to start with you, if I may. When we look at the work that you do in terms of research, looking at your clients, looking at the industry, just bring us perhaps up to date and give us maybe an overview of where you see we are here at this time in 2019. Well, for sure. Thank you. And thank you for that amazing introduction. And I, I totally echo Etna's points that we need much more aggressive goals. And um, that's part of what, what I hope we'll be talking about today. When we look at this industry, if we have a little context, uh, we've been through so much uh, change in the last five years even. We've gone from the era of scarcity, where the price of oil was $100 and the price of gas was double what it is today, both here in Canada and North America and internationally. Uh, to everything being cut in half. And that's really because of all this technology that has brought on so much more supply at a lower price. And it's not just US tidal, which I think it's sometimes depicted, or US shale gas. Actually, there's been innovation around the world, and many of you know that, the break-even prices necessary to bring on new projects, whether it be offshore or in the Canadian oil sands, are literally half of what they used to be. And that has been a huge amount of disruption to our technology and to our jobs. Companies have had to focus on how can we make money at these lower price levels. At the same time, the investors in oil and gas industry are totally changing what they expect from the industry as well. 
In the past, you would hold an oil and gas stock with the view that, well, so there's scarcity, prices will go up, I will get a return from increasing equity values. They've given up on that. They believe that it's lower forever, and the only way to get money out of oil, holding an oil and gas stock is through dividends or share buybacks. And these companies, not only do we have to, to deal with lower commodity prices, but somehow carve out a bunch of money to give back to investors. So a major paradigm change in terms of the importance of low cost relative to five years ago. And then, of course, now we have these uh, cries for GHG emissions reductions, major reductions. And I agree the world needs to reduce its, reduction, redu reduce its emissions, and so does the oil and gas industry. You know, there was a view, and I think there still is a view, that we can just transition quickly off hydrocarbons to renewables and zero emission energy. And I think the world's coming to the recognition that it'll be very difficult to do that. We're not showing, you know, it's five years almost since the Paris Agreement, yet fossil fuel consumption goes up every single year. And so what we really need to do is transition to zero emission technologies, but also drastically reduce, reduce the emissions from oil and gas because we're going to need them for years to come. And so the industry is really facing the challenge of a generation, I believe. Not only do we have to meet the low cost challenge, uh, provide returns to shareholders, we need to aggressively reduce our carbon emissions. And I'm just excited that you're all here because we're going to need smart, bright people to solve some of the biggest challenges uh, of this industry's history and look forward to talking more about it. And indeed, we have a few days. I think you know there's so many great papers and so many great opportunities to actually discuss this. And it is, you know, it's very timely also that this is you know, our opening session here, and it's very high on the agenda. Andre, when we look at the demands from an energy company, an oil company like yourself, you need to be more environmentally friendly. You need to be more efficient. How can you actually combine all this into the industry at the moment? OK. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, unfortunately, traditionally, oil and gas business is connected with risk and especially with uh, env environmental risks. And uh, when we talk about uh, the risks of such a uh, character, we need to think and maybe re uh, re rethink the role of uh, new technologies, uh, digitalization and innovation. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, we need to think how to utilize the new technologies in order to uh, decrease this level of uh, environmental risks uh, in order to support our people on the field side and uh, how to avoid the uh, most of environmental risks. Uh, you've heard a lot of, about conception of uh, digital field and of course it's uh, the conception which will allow uh, to avoid uh, some uh, dangerous uh, situations for, for, for people. It's also a lot of activities now is in, is, uh, in industry in order to decrease the level of, uh, uh, level of uh, wrong, mistake, uh, wrong decisions. Because I think the second role of new technologies for the new world is, is how to decrease the level of these uh, risks for uh, wrong decisions. Because unfortunately, a lot of risks are coming from lack of data, lack of collaboration, etc. And we need to uh, collaborate more openly, um, collaborate more efficiently between companies to change more data. And I really like that now a lot of uh, positive initiatives are coming from companies like uh, Open Surface Data Universe, et cetera, in order to change uh, information, best practices, lessons learned more effectively. We will see a lot of cutting edge technologies on this conference and just uh, uh, halls uh, ho ho hall, uh, close by. And I think it's a demonstration of how service companies, how oil and gas companies are engaged uh, to the, this, uh, these questions, uh, these issues, and I hope this is the way how to re reduce this uh, environmental risk and the risk for our people. Thank you. Um, Leanne, when we look at, um, in a sort of similar vein, you know, what energy companies and what oil and gas companies have to do. We have to contribute towards economic growth. We have to do so more efficiently and we have to reduce emissions. There really is almost a three-tier approach that still has to continue. So how can you know, oil and gas companies sort of reconcile all of this and make sure that they deliver what the world needs at the end of the day? Well, I think Etna, it's uh, evolution. And I'd like to just take a moment to thank Sami and the Society of Petroleum Engineers for hosting this debate as the opening session for ATCE. I've been a member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers for 22 years. I'm a chartered petroleum engineer, spent most of my life in drilling and completions. And, it, and it's about the evolution of our industry. Now, we think about oil and gas and what's needed for the future. 
energy demand is going to grow between now and 2040 by one third. That's a China plus an EU. Although if you're from the United Kingdom, like me, you don't talk about the EU anymore, so it's a China plus two Indias. It's huge. And at the same time, we've got to take down the emissions by a half and get to net zero by the middle of the century. That's an amazing challenge for our industry. But let's just remember for a moment, there are a billion people in this world who do not have access to electricity right now. Not electricity in their homes, not their schools and their hospitals. And there's another two billion people joining the population between 2017 and, and 2040. And 82% of the population have not traveled on an airplane today. And every citizen of our planet deserves the same privileges that we have sitting in this conference hall today. So it's a dual energy challenge. How do we provide the oil and gas the world needs more cleanly and more efficiently and at the same time bring down emissions? And that's where companies like BP become pivotal because we are not only tackling the clean and energy efficiency side, we're also at BP investing half a billion dollars a year in low carbon activities, including 200 million in new low carbon ventures. So oil and gas companies not only have a crucial role to play in the future, I think we have the crucial role to play in this energy challenge. Thank you, and again, thank you, I think, for reminding us of that, and it's something we all need to keep in mind. And again, I think the topic today is very, very timely. We look at what's been going on around the world, and I think, again, we look at the work that SP is doing too and the strategy that is in place. Um, jean may when we look at responsible energy development, you know, what commitments has Baker Hughes done, you know, as a company to address, you know, climate change? And also, it's the big energy transition. And we're all there, I think, without a doubt, nobody mm -hmm. is denying that it's happening. So as a company, what are you doing? Absolutely, very happy to uh, talk about our commitments because we at Baker Hughes believe that climate change is one of the biggest challenges we face today and that we as a company and the oil and gas industry have a major role to play. That's because we also think that oil and gas will continue to be a significant part of the energy mix for some time to come, even as other energies like renewables continue to grow. So what are we doing as a company? Well, our strategy has three parts. First, we are aggressively reducing emissions from our own operations. In January this year, we made the bold commitment to be net zero by 2050 with a 50% reduction by 2030. Our net zero by 2050 goal is aligned with what the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says is necessary to limit global warming to one and a half degrees in the post-industrial period. And I'm very pleased to say that over the past seven years, we've reduced our footprint by 34%. The second part of our strategy is to use our existing technology to help the industry control its emissions. Ultimately, we want to be a net zero partner to our customers, which means that when we serve them with our products and services, we are doing so with a net zero footprint. We're actively engaged with many of our customers today in various low carbon projects and we'll be happy to talk about some of those technologies and projects uh, on this panel. Finally, we're investing in the development of new technologies so that we can continue to lead in this space and build a very robust portfolio of low carbon solutions through a combination of both internal R&D as well as partnerships uh, with others in the ecosystem and uh, new ventures. So why are we doing this? And I really want to underscore why we are doing this. We think that commitments like ours will fundamentally improve the competitiveness of oil and gas in the energy mix. We've all heard about the challenges at Climate Week last week, the challenges that we continue to get as an industry. And right now, there's many people who believe that oil and gas are just inherently dirty. But it's not oil and gas per se, it's the emissions from oil and gas that are dirty. And that's why 
we need to steadily reduce our collective footprints and the footprints from our products, and that will make uh, oil and gas more competitive in the energy mix. And then people will look at it purely from a cost and performance standpoint, which is really what we want people to be doing at the end of the day. Thank you so much. Um, and I do see we've got loads of questions. You're making my job very, very easy here today. Um, so we'll get to them, I promise you, in a minute. Just a few quick things that I want to continue this conversation with. And I was just looking at um, a report from EPA and looking at where emissions are coming from. And we're looking at transport, more than 28%. Electricity, more than 27%. Industry, more than 22%. Commercial and residential, more than 11 Agriculture, 9 and then land use and forestry, you know, the offset there is happening. But when we look, Jackie, at the concept of net zero emissions, and again, let's think about what exactly does this mean? Is it to balance the amount of emitted greenhouse gases with the equivalent emissions that are either offset or sequestered? What's, what's the kind of meaning and, uh, you know, do we have a unified meaning? Are we all heading in the one direction? Oh, I definitely think there's different definitions out there. I mean, I think the definition is it's on the, uh, like for a country like Canada or any country, uh, in 2050, if we were to achieve net zero, which uh, our current uh, prime minister who's re running for re-election has promised if he is re-elected, Canada also would take on a net zero 2050 goal. And I believe it's any emissions that would be coming out of Canada in 2050, we would be offsetting by sequestering CO2 to offset that. And so the net part of net zero is very important. And I do believe without it, it would be very difficult to achieve. But basically, can we sequester carbon uh, enough to offset the emissions that we do have? So, you know, we can imagine a world where we're still using oil and gas in 2050, which is gonna be hard to imagine not having any oil and gas but that we're sequestering the CO2 associated with that usage. And when we think about carbon capture and storage, which by the way, Canada is leaders. Uh, of the 18 or so projects that are around the world today, four are in Canada. Uh, there's a X prize right now for carbon capture, storage and use. Four of the top um, prizes or the, the runners up so far have come from Canada. So we're leaders in this stuff. Um, but it's not just what you think of in terms of we have to have these big industrial plants that capture CO2 and geologically store it, which has uh, been sort of the definition to date. There is a lot of emerging technologies now, growing trees, uh, there's technologies around growing, creating large swamps to grow um, seaweed and then bury that seaweed. So I think there's going to be a lot of technology developed over the next 20 years, which will reduce the cost of capturing CO2, doing it a lot of different ways, and that can achieve the net zero, along with major reductions in how, much, how many emissions we directly have. That's very important as well, but I think it's gonna be very hard to get to net zero without uh, carbon uh, sequestering of many different types. Now, I was listening uh, briefly to your podcast, and you talked a lot about um, the Energy Futures Initiative and the work that uh, former Energy Secretary for the U.S., Ernie Muniz, is doing as well. And again, that technology is not just one source. I mean, there's just an incredible amount that they're looking at. Yeah, and I'd really suggest, so we have an ARC Energy Ideas podcast. You can listen to it on iTunes iTunes, we have a weekly podcast. This week we talked about the Climate Week, about Greta Thunberg, about the consumption challenge, the fact that in order to meet these type of reduction emissions, we're gonna have to change our lifestyles to some extent too. Uh, but the one thing, I, I, there's a link there on the podcast to the Energy uh, Futures Initiative, and they have you know, lots of different technologies. Basically what Ernie Moniz, former Secretary of Energy, is saying is that we need about $10 billion in 10 years to advance these uh, carbon sequestration technologies. And there's a wide set of things he's talking about, like taking CO2, turning it into minerals, uh, taking CO2, uh, injecting it into the ocean. There's a whole bunch of different pathways, uh, you know, planting trees, but in a very different way, more efficient way than we do today, that we can sequester a ton of CO2. And you know, tree planting, sometimes we look at the hardest thing as engineers, right? Like, oh, we need to build a big metal plant and we have to use a lot of energy. Like tree planting, people are saying there was a, a study by Yale that said if the world were to plant a trillion trees, it would offset 10 years of carbon emissions. Like tree planting can really have a big impact and you're seeing um, countries including Canada, our current prime minister uh, committing to planting trees on Friday. Um, I think that there's gotta be recognition that sequestering can take many different forms. 
again, and it comes down to, you know, I think the technology and the great minds that, that are here, and all of you know what's going on, you know, the great geologists and scientists that are among you and the great engineers, you know, who can really put their minds together to come up, you know, with a great solution, which we need. Let's talk about the technology. Andre, when we look at the importance of technology and being part of the answer, and perhaps maybe put it in terms of what you're doing also at Gazprom Neft. Uh, so when we talk about uh, reducing of emissions in Gazprom, you have to just like uh, uh, for in other companies uh, in, in Russia, of course, it's supported from very different levels, starting from the government level, because we, all companies need to reduce emissions uh, for flaring uh, associated petroleum gas by 95%. Uh, so it's uh, stressed, but also supported by the government. And also it's a lot of activities uh, on, the, on, on the side of... Uh, uh, companies on the side of service companies. Uh, it's uh, very interesting that it's not a, just a case or just some positive initiative. It's like a program. It's a leadership for uh, improving HEC uh, issues here. And uh, by the way, uh, just one example in terms of pr uh, production, in terms of, for example, uh, seismic seismic survey. A lot of uh, you know a lot of forests are cutting down uh, during the seismic survey. It's also relevant for Canada, like uh, for, for Russia. And uh, the uh, modern technologies, more and modern innovations like uh, wireless seismic, etc., allows uh, to reduce uh, by 90% of uh, deforestation. And, think, and I think the uh, initiative, something like this, could uh, be supported like a program approach for uh, not only reducing emissions, but also more uh, responsible attitude for environmental uh, issues. And I think we're seeing that from you know, every company. Again, looking at BP, Leanne, what are you doing in terms of, you know, looking at, you know, how do you reduce emissions, particularly when using technology? Well, um, as an engineer, I know a lot more about big metal plant than I do about tree planting, but I'm definitely willing to take up that challenge personally. Um, we think about it in, in, a, in a simple framework, and it's reduce, improve, and create. It's not just enough to look at reducing emissions. There's more to it than that. So, in the reduce space, which is really in my side of the business and upstream, that's about introducing technologies to reduce emissions. So examples might be in pipeline inspection. Uh, we used to do pipeline inspection with a very human nature, people going out to the field, looking at pipelines, inspecting the integrity of the pipelines. That's hugely intensive. We now do that with magnetic crawlers which are much more efficient and actually more accurate than, than humans. So that is one piece of technology that's come in. But um, what about emissions that do happen? How do we spot them more quickly and tackle them? We've just done a pilot in our North Sea business using drones to detect emissions. We can do that much faster and, and treat any leaks much more quickly. And we're going to deploy that technology at scale across our businesses and then flaring. Flaring is huge for our industry, and we're doing a lot of work to reduce emissions from flaring, including using spectro-radiography cameras, which look at the images from our flaring um, operations and look to quantify the combustion efficiency of our flares. So huge amount of cool technology on the emission side, but we also look at improving and creating, improving in our petrochemicals business, looking at how can we make more efficient fuels, lubricants, and petrochemicals. Quite simply, that means while we still have the internal combustion engine, how do we get more mileage per gallon and less um, CO2 emissions? And then finally, on the create side, um, BP, along with many other companies, are making huge investments in new businesses, such as BP Light Source, which is bringing in solar industry at scale across the world. We have invested in Fulcrum, which takes municipal waste and turns it into biojet fuel. And we're also looking at Charge Master in the United Kingdom, which allows super fast charging of electric vehicles, 100 miles in under 10 minutes. And we're installing Charge Master in all of our petrol stations, gas stations in the United Kingdom. So when you tackle things from improve, reduce, and create, you can see technology has a vital role to play in our industry. And ultimately, it's also about you know, meeting consumer demand. I think this is something that we all have to remember is what the oil and gas and the energy sector has done from day one. 
when you look at your mandate and look at the responsibility. Um, Jean May, if we could stay with technology at sure. the moment, you know, and um, I do have, I'll get to your questions here, there's some very interesting ones here. But, you know, talk to me about what Baker Hughes is doing, you know, as a company to really use technology to actually help your customers reduce their carbon footprint. I know we heard what you're doing, but again, what are your customers demanding? Absolutely. So, very excited to say that we have an already existing portfolio of low carbon solutions um, that span the up, mid, and downstream. And they also span various applications from modular power to measurement and control and digital solutions. And we continue to develop technologies in anticipation of market needs. We think about our solutions across several categories which all align with the major emission challenges. So venting, flaring, and fugitives, power and compression, uh, the oil field, subsea, and also renewables and alternative energy. So I'll give a couple of examples, and I have a lot, so stop me if, uh, if I'm going on too long. So if I think about venting, flaring, and fugitives, uh, Leanne just talked about um, flaring. So we have something called Flare IQ, which is a flare management system that allows downstream operators to optimize their flares and it reduces flaring related emissions by about 90% or about 12,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent per flare per year. So these are not trivial numbers. If really, you that's impressive. Yes. think about all of the flares in refineries and petrochemicals plants worldwide, we estimate that that system could reduce emissions by about 190 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. And you also get a reduction in cost associated with uh, producing steam. Leanne also talked about methane monitoring. And we have Lumen, which is our methane monitoring and inspection uh, suite, which runs on solar power. We have a stationary system. We have a drone-based system. It quantifies leak rates and concentrations on a 24 by 7 basis and provides live data through sensors um, that are streamed. The government in Canada, the Environment and Climate Change Canada uh, Department recently commissioned a study using Lumen to look at several fields in northern Alberta to test what actual empirical measurements of methane are compared to the emissions factors that have been used for, for such a long time. And as you can imagine, there was quite a bit of variation between the factors and what was empirically seen. Uh, we're doing a lot of work in compression, and I mentioned to Alexei that um, in, uh, for Gazprom Neft in Siberia, we recently um, are going to be uh, installing what we call a mini integrated compressor line, um, which will compress and monetize associated gas released during oil separation. And then that gas can either be exported or used. And that gas was formerly wasted and just flaring into the atmosphere. Um, to give you some context on the flaring issue, Russia is estimated to flare about 20 uh, billion cubic meters of gas each year, or about the 5% fi of the annual gas consumption of the European Union. So it's not a trivial amount. And now this gas will actually be captured and, and monetized. And it also reduces OPEX and CAPEX. So there's hopefully what you see with all these examples that is that it's not only about reducing footprint, it's also about the associated economic benefit, which is key for adoption at the end of the day. And we have gas turbines that are energy efficient uh, as well. Uh, we've got oil field solutions we're efficient. So I will stop There's there. Lots. I'm no, seeing no, the I'm but, seeing the stop sign. But, but I think uh, you're also, you know, you're so right putting it in place as in it has to be you know, it, it ticks a lot of boxes, you know, but when it yeah. makes good business sense, yeah. you know, it has to be done with a lot more speed. Andre, yeah. I want you to mm -hmm. come in on this because she specifically mentioned the flaring in Russia, mm -hmm. you know. So again, as a company, how are you approaching this at the moment? Mm -hmm. uh, so as, as I said, we also have the program to reduce the flaring to 95 percent. And uh, uh, it's very important that uh, pre previously and maybe for now, it's uh, lack of uh, technologies for uh, monetizing, as you said, uh, the value of uh, uh, flare, flare associated petroleum gas. But, but for now, it's a lot of activities uh, and a lot of innovations are used in companies. So we're trying to monetize uh, most of uh, uh, flared 
previous deferred flyer uh, gas and also using for for example internal reuse on the field etc and i think it's like a program as i said and uh, i think the this number it's 95% of reduction is it's it's really key okay um, and of course there's a lot more to do i know we're having a panel on methane emissions tomorrow, and flaring is something that's coming up in that. So I'm really looking forward to really getting more in-depth, and I'm sure it's something we're looking at. I want to come back to you, Leanne, because there is a question here that is, it's got your name on it without a doubt, and it seems to sort of move around here. I can't keep up with this. But it says, has anybody on the stage actually worked in the field? Um, and how can we maintain or change the mentality in the field? with the engineers, and I've heard this time and time again at conferences saying we've got great leadership from the top, but actually when you're out there getting your hands dirty, that there's often maybe a different story. Do you want to start that one off? What uh, is, and are you seeing over the years that mentality shifting? So um, th thank you for that. Um, I, I maybe have a slightly different view because um, I have worked in the field. I spent uh, 22 years in drilling and completions. I was previously vice president of our drilling and completions business uh, and, and in terms of our head of engineering and operations globally. And I started my career in the field and this was not a debate in the 90s when you were a field engineer. And I think that's radically changed today. I think that we talk to our teams globally about what the challenge in the industry is and many of the ideas that we get come from the engineers who are working day in and day out in the field. And I think that is really important because we can sit in our offices and think of these great suggestions, but actually when you're working with flare stacks, when you're looking at how can I spec this pipe in a different way, when you're thinking about drones and crawlers, it re those ideas really have to come from the guys and girls who are out in the field doing the job. And I can tell you, we have fantastic engagement across our company particularly people and are young who come into the oil and gas industry, they don't want to be branded as being part of an old guard. They have young families, they have the future of the planet at their hearts as much as every other environmentalist on the globe. And, and they're super enthusiastic about coming forward with suggestions about how to change the way that we produce oil and gas. Um, I, I really want to get through some of these questions because we have lots, so I'm not going to ask all of you to answer every one of them. Um, let me, and maybe I might put a few of them together. So, uh, Jack, if we could hear. When we look at what do we mean by industry emissions, and does this include emissions from combustion of about 85% of our products? Mm -hmm. And if I could wrap this with another question and one that is asking for Leanne to comment as well. Which would be responsible goals for oil and gas sector to comply with the Paris Agreement? which specific areas make a significant impact into abating carbon emissions. So yeah. we can wrap them together. Perfect, and thank you for that question, whoever asked it, because it's a really important point. So um, our numbers show, and we've, I've done like about uh, many life cycle emissions studies, but in general, about 80% of the emissions from oil and gas come when we combust. So whether we combust the natural gas at a power plant or we combust the oil in our, in our cars. Or, or planes. And so when the industry says we're going to get to net zero by 2050, you know, that doesn't deal with 80% of the emissions. So we haven't solved the climate change problem to, at 2050 if all we do is reduce our upstream emissions. Um, also, you know, when you think about it, we, we have something like 77 countries that have now signed on to net zero pledges by 2050. Uh, that is going to have implications for the demand for oil and gas. You know, we're not going to offset all of that. If they really do make those uh, aggressive goals, uh, there's going to be a lot less demand for oil and gas in the world with implications for our industry as well. So I believe we have to be uh, much, we have to set our bar way higher than we have as an industry to date. Um, and I think we have to consider thinking about net zero uh, in terms of upstream and downstream emissions because without it, it's very hard to see uh, you know, the demand continue to be strong if countries act on these aggressive goals. And it may seem impossible, right? Like impossible to reduce the downstream emissions. Co uh, companies like Shell have made commitments to reduce their downstream emissions by 50% by 2050. How are they gonna do that? Well, one thing is they're adding 
uh, at the pump, you have to pay a couple more cents a liter, and they put that money towards tree planting. They're talking about diverting more of their products to petrochemicals, which don't have combustion. And so uh, there's also technologies like right now Occidental in the Permian using Canadian technology from Squamish, BC called carbon engineering is doing a pilot where they're capturing CO2 from the atmosphere. They're injecting that into the oil reservoir. They're going to inject as much CO2 as both the upstream and downstream emissions associated with the oil they produce. So this would actually be net zero upstream, downstream, and equivalent to renewables, and a product that should exist 100 years from now if it would work. Um, we've also got, by the way, in Canada here, we have a carbon trunk line that's starting up this year, and a company called Enhance Energy that is also going to do net zero upstream and downstream. So these aren't just like science experiments. You know, the, the, these things could really happen, and I think our industry has to be thinking much bigger than it is today, uh, so that we can have that long term, um, provide that energy to people, but do it in a way that helps meet these very ambitious climate goals. It is because it has to be sustainable. Leanne, this question to part of that was specifically. Um, you know, directed to you, which specific areas, you know, can make a significant impact into abating carbon emissions? And I know you've covered some of them. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if this question is actually about scope three emissions, which is how our customers use our products. And I think we're still um, thinking deeply about how we can do that. R right now, for us, um, we can't control that. Um, whether someone goes to work in their diesel SUV versus four people going in a hybrid car, you know, is, is, is not something that we control. We do welcome regulations um, set and the, uh, the governments that we support setting strong regulations here. So meantime, it's back to that RIC framework for us. We have our own internal goals and the upstream we set ourselves a target of three and a half million tons reduction of emissions. We've achieved that early. We are also um, a strong part of the oil and gas climate change initiative that looks at uh, set ambitious methane intensity reduction targets. I think we came down by 9% already, if I remember that figure correctly. And then it's across each area of that business, reducing our emissions, improving the efficiency of our products, and creating new carbon ventures that will get to the heart of addressing all the needs that, that um, comes along with our climate change ambitions. Um, following on that, Jean, may if we can look at a question specifically um, for you and also maybe Andre can look at this one as well. How can oil and gas organizations solve such complex environmental problems while, more important, governments around the world don't all seem convinced that there is an issue? I mean, it, is it, it the industry and government that right. need to work together and one needs to perhaps talk closer to the other? Sure. I mean. I think most of the people on this panel, not speaking for them, but I think they would agree that, you know, we are doing our part with governments, but also in the absence of, of some government intervention. And I think that there's a lot of activity globally that occurs at the sub-national level, so at states or provinces or even in, in cities. And so, you know, we just, we think it's the right thing to do. Of course, if you know, if there are more uniform regulations that are standardized, I think that would be helpful, but um, we're certainly not waiting for that. I think we need to get a move on now, as you've said in your opening remarks and others have said in their opening remarks, and so we just need to do what we can and, and, not, and not wait. Um, but yes, obviously, more collaboration with governments, with other stakeholders is, is always welcome. Andre. I would, totally, I would totally agree with uh, the, the, this thesis because um, I think it's not uh, about how to uh, use the different KPIs from government and the company's uh, sites. It's, uh, uh, I, I would totally agree that this is a dialogue, it's a collaboration, how to, how to use it more, more uh, appropriate and effective way. Yeah, did you want to come in quickly on this one yeah, and I move just, on to this? I, I would add, I mean, perception is not reality. I mean, the, the reality is that every year a hydrocarbon use goes up. So there is a need for stronger policy if we're going to meet these, these very aggressive goals. Uh, to give you an example, last year on an energy equivalent basis, oil and gas added three times as much energy as renewables. 
uh, we invested about 300 billion into renewables last year and about 450 billion into oil and gas. So it's very hard to not keep having hydrocarbons go up because for almost the same money, we can add three times the energy. And so we're gonna really need a much stronger policy environment it's not, it, to meet these aggressive goals. And when politicians make goals for 2050, uh, there's gonna have to be some interim things done to get us there. And I, I believe you know, the industry in general has been very supportive of a carbon tax because a carbon tax, uh, if we had a global carbon tax, there'd be more economic incentive to reduce the emissions. And so I hope that uh, we continue to, to have dialogues with government and that we start to see policies that really support these aggressive goals that they're making. And I think that's essential. I think we're hearing that from, you know, from all of the organizations, from OPEC, from the national oil companies, international oil companies. It really has to be the big dialogue and everybody has to be involved. Let's race through a few of these and I'm pulling a few questions together in one area, and I know you're all very passionate about it too, is about talent management in this industry too. So we've got a few questions here. You know, what are the actions or plans of the SPE? I know none of us here, particularly speaking for the SPE, but we are all members. Um, how can we help, you know, young people pursue a career in oil and gas? Um, again, how will young people look at oil and gas? And is there long-term career options in this industry? And also, why does the energy industry not necessarily spend more. You're asking not spend more on marketing. I don't know if that's the, the real issue here. Um, on its efforts towards climate change and like letting the world know what they're doing because there is a perception perhaps that we're not doing enough. And when we hear all of the great work that all the companies are doing, it's, um, we maybe need to shout about it. So maybe I'll come back to, to you, Jean-May, if you want to start that. But sure. I think it's something you all have something to say on. Absolutely. Um, so I think, I mean, I'm not from the industry, and, and I think this is a great industry for people who are simply attracted by challenge and the possibility of working on exciting problems and solving them. And that's really the message that we ought to be giving to people who are considering careers and different options. I mean, this is, as I said in my opening, this is the challenge of our times. And this is a real opportunity to be in the industry where we actually have an opportunity to solve those. Jackie mentioned you know, some of the very interesting, interesting things going on in carbon capture and direct air capture in particular. I mean, those are all areas where in the limit we could actually have a completely circular uh, economy and actually be able to use oil and gas without emissions. And how exciting would that be? That would be a very interesting and very important outcome if we could work toward that. So I think this industry offers tremendous uh, opportunity for people looking to make a difference. Um, Leanne, I know this is something you're absolutely passionate about here. And again, looking at your own career and what you've done. I just think we have to get better at storytelling. Um, we're a bit too engineering about it and talk about metric tons reductions, which I've just done, and not actually talk about the stories of our industry in a very different way. And um, so here's a story. I was, um, took my team to Palo Alto to, to meet some of tech industries to find out how we can adopt more digital into how we run our business. And we were out running early in the morning and one of my young millennial team members caught me and she was really inspired by what we'd seen. But she said, you know, I love the oil and gas industry. So how do we make this industry as cool as some of the tech companies that we've just visited? And I did not even need to pause breath to say, well, hang on a minute. Our industry provides heat light and mobility for the world. If that's not cool, what do you think about, I'm sorry, Coca-Cola, Facebook, <laughs> they make fizzy drinks. I'm not entirely sure what Facebook actually does, but you know, I'm sure it has a role <laughs> in the world, but there. It occasionally keeps us connected. <laughs> it's connected, connection. But you know, there's a direct yes. correlation between what oil and gas yes. have done to lift people out of poverty. And there will be a direct correlation in this industry for that for years to come. So that is super cool. And then how cool is it then to be part of the evolution of the next phase of the energy industry where we would continue to lift people out of poverty and we start to diversify into different energy sources that the planet needs to survive. And again, it's so, I think, as you said too, it's so exciting when we look at the great work that's been done in the industry and the great work in terms of science and 
engineering and all of that and the great brains that are sitting in this room. You know, and I think sometimes in the day to day, just rolling out of your jobs, you probably forget what a tremendous impact that each one makes every day of our lives. And I think this is something we probably need to come back to. Absolutely. I wanna, I wanna just add something, because I, I wouldn't say maybe it's any of the companies on this stage, but there are, is um, a message out there from the industry that you know things are expensive, it's too expensive to deal with these things. And, and I think we can't afford not to deal with them. And we can't afford, you know, the world is going in one direction and the oil and gas industry needs to go in that same direction. So I would love to see the industry around the world start to embrace targets that are very aggressive, like net zero, put real money towards them yes. and stop saying they can't afford it. I'm not, not saying every company is doing that, but there's definitely a message out there. I think that will attract more people to our industry because they want that vision too. Most people do. Um, and you know, if they see being part of this industry is not going to meet that future vision, we're not going to attract the people we need to be relevant and here 20 years from now. Absolutely. And for you know, Russia too as well, you look at you know, the energy demands even in your country. Mm -hmm. You have to continually keep you know, filling these positions. So it's, it's tough out there. There is a big war for talent and getting the right talent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, what we've seen now that uh, the paradigm is changing because uh, across the world where uh, comes from very high quality resources to very low quality resources, it's a conventional, etc. It's a lot of new challenges for industry. And of course, a lot of challenges needs to be supported by the new talents. And uh, I think the new challenge for the uh, oil and gas industry, industry it's not uh, only attracting the talents, but also think how to work with a uh, generation of Y, uh, generation of millennials who is uh, fully digitally friendly, who is uh, working with uh, some kind of agile formats, and they, they hate uh, bureaucracy, etc. By the way, I'm also the part of the generation of millennials. But uh, at the same time, they need to think how to create the conditions for these people in order to be more uh, uh, open, for, for, for a more open work, and uh, how to create uh, additional terms and the conditions for these people. In Gazprom Neft, they have uh, our digital trans trans transformation strategy, and they also have this separate building where the people uh, from a different uh, specialties are sitting uh, together and working together. This is data scientists, uh, mathematicians, uh, geologists, etc. And it's very interesting how magic has happened in, in this building because uh, a lot of activities, a lot of um, initiatives are uh, born in this building just for three months, six months, because it's another way of working. It's not only about uh, talent attracting, but also how to create this uh, new way of working, way of creating of value for the industry. Indeed. Um, one for you, if I could now come back to some of the great work that you're doing. Could we interest the public in paying more for zero carbon fuel that removes carbon equal to that combusted? And could zero carbon fuel be considered as green? First of all, Shell is trying that. So they have pilots in some countries in Europe right now where they're adding so many cents per liter. So you may not be able to afford an electric car, but maybe you could afford to pay a uh, dollar or two more for that tank of gas that you just bought, knowing that that money is going to go plant a tree somewhere that's going to offset the carbon associated with that tank of fuel. And I think um, people are starting to recognize that consumption and your own individual behaviors have to change for us to meet these targets. You know, Greta Thunberg, um, we had her on the, we talked about her in the podcast, and Aetna didn't agree with everything we said, but you know, I, I think, I welcome what she's saying because she's actually pointing the finger at the consumption side, not just that long pointy finger that seems to go to the supply side all the time and says, oh, you suppliers need to change, industry needs to change. Well, actually, almost half emissions are, are totally out of control of, of our companies, right? You know, it's like how warm you keep your home, how big your home is, how big of a car you drive, how many airplane flights you take for holidays. And Greta's saying, uh, stop your meat eating meat. Uh, stop traveling for holidays. Like we as individuals have to make major changes in our own lifestyles to meet these very aggressive goals. And I think that includes paying more for your fuel. I think it means paying more money to get an electric car. Uh, yeah, it's twice the price of a comparable combustion vehicle, but if you care about the planet and you're gonna go be a climate activist, you need to walk the talk. You need to start paying more and reducing your own emissions. And I don't think everyone that's showing up really fully understands the message she has. Um, but I hope that's one positive contribution she can make, is make people more aware, and all of us more aware, um, that it's going to take some personal sacrifices too. Indeed, so if she's bothering the oil and gas industry, 
she's desperately uh, bothering the farmers, I would imagine, at this point as well. Um, it was, uh, there was a very funny uh, radio program on when I was in Ireland this year, and the farmers were up in, uh, you know, in arms, so to speak, about this. And there was a, a lovely conversation between a farmer and a, a sort of a young, what they would have called Dublin Four. And as the farmer said, you're there eating your sort of out of season avocados and quinoa that's flying all around the world to be on your plate. Where actually what you probably need to do is just enjoy a decent steak and let us get on with our business. So I think there's a lot of people that have to do a lot. And it comes not just this industry, the cement industry, mm -hmm. big industry infrastructure, and indeed the food we eat. But yeah, it's a yeah. huge look well, that we have to do everything. Like electric car sales are slowing. So there's a real gap between perception and reality here. Like everyone wants zero emission, but they're not willing to pay for it. So. How can the industry, you know, and again, a question here that says, do we think that it's realistic? Maybe, Jaume, if you can look at this, or any of you here, realistic to hit these goals without the buy-in from the public? And again, it follows up on what you're saying here. Is it also a responsibility, perhaps, of the energy producers and people who work within this industry to talk more to your consumers? And I think when we've looked at a lower oil price, people have certainly become a lot more efficient in terms of how they run their business. You know, but again, is there a wider message we need out there to get everybody to actually look deep inside what's going on and be more efficient just overall? Absolutely. I mean, I certainly we're all private citizens. We all have the right to speak out in a private capacity with our friends, with our family to carry that message forward. But we also think that representing big companies in the oil and gas industry, we have to start with ourselves first. We have to get our own house in order. And so again, that's why you know, we're very focused on our footprint and that of our customers. We don't actually control, I mean, BP and Gazprom Neff don't co control the use of the product by the end consumer. We certainly control it even less, but nonetheless, for our scope three emissions, we very much want to help our customers reduce their emissions. So we're trying to tackle it as best we can with where we're coming from. But absolutely, I mean, we need to be having a much broader conversation. And, and your earlier question was, how can we tell our story better? I think, you know, as I read the coverage of Climate Week um, and I hear, you know, statements by prominent political figures calling for 100% renewables and not understanding the difference between 100% renewables and 100% you know, carbon neutral. I mean, that's a big difference and we have to be constantly talking about and educating people on that and, and frankly, engaging with the stakeholders who are against us, um, who maybe don't understand some of the nuances, some, some of the carbon capture use and sequestration nuances. So I think there's a lot there, but it does start with listening and it does start with having a humility to listen and to open you know, be open and, and hear those other points of view as well. Um, Jackie, if I could, uh, a specific question here on, uh, what do we see? We understand how to geologically sequester CO2 and can do it successfully. Little comes from removing it from the atmosphere. What can the industry do to help reduce the CO2 in the atmosphere and take that also with, and perhaps some of the rest of you will come in on this, what's the possibility of installing smart carbon capture devices at drilling and production locations? Yeah, so I think a great question, because by the way, I don't want to give you the message that we can just keep doing what we're doing and we'll just sequester it all, because that would be like a lot of CO2 over decades. Uh, we have to reduce our emissions, absolutely direct emissions as much as we can. I think the lowest hanging fruit is obviously methane. Uh, methane emissions create uh, many times more impact to warming than CO2. And you're starting to see more and more studies that recognize that. You know, if we take a molecule of CO2 out of the atmosphere, it doesn't actually change the path of global warming for over 100 years. But if we take methane out, which is mostly gone in the next 20 years, one molecule of methane goes up, it's pretty much gone, but it has a much higher um, heating cause in that shorter time frame. Uh, something like two or three times more heating. And I think, you know, how we think about using fresh water today in the oil and gas industry compared to how we felt about it 10 years ago, 10 years from now, I think it will be completely unacceptable to be releasing methane into the atmosphere um, because it has that higher heating um, and it's just easy to not do it. And I know that it costs money, and, uh, but I believe that those technologies are relatively cheap compared to many other things. So I think that's one of the lowest hanging fruit. And I know groups like the oil 
and Gas Climate Initiative is on that and many groups here in Canada as well. Obviously, electrification is another huge opportunity. Uh, you don't have zero emission electricity everywhere, but here in northern Alberta, we have a big hydro dam going up. I think there's a great opportunity there to electrify our upstream so that we don't have any emissions. And I think around the world, there are opportunities to electrify the upstream, and that would significantly reduce the emissions on the upstream side of the industry. And so I'm sure our panelists have many other ideas. Um, but these are all doable things. Like, the technologies are there. The question is the price. And again, it is that investment. Anyone else want to come in specifically on this? Um, one, I, maybe I have, I can, there's a lot here we have to go to. So um, Andre, again, uh, maybe, this is a good one for you. How do we bridge the gap between early and late adapters of these new digital transformation tools that will actually help us to expedite innovation? So while a lot of work is out there, and I think in terms of robotics, in terms of all of that stuff, there's probably a bit of a crew change going on sometimes that maybe, maybe not everybody's on board. So how do we do that? Oh, it's, it's a perfect question. Uh, actually, we are considering the digital transformation like, a, first of all, organizational transformation by uh, digital tools. And of course, uh, we, in every digital uh, project, we need to combine uh, digital uh, technology and organizational aspects because uh, I just give you an example. Uh, if we will I don't know, uh, invent some brilliant technology, but we will no change the workflow, how people work, it's, it will be use, useless. So they need to think not only how to create uh, the digital uh, solution, it's not a, it's not a key, uh, but how to uh, very fast implementing it to the uh, existing workflow. So of course, uh, for the first uh, level of, let's say, digital transformation, uh, it's a, a very limited part of the organization, like uh, early innovations. But if we will use it like uh, uh, changing workflow, changing the way of working for uh, people who are uh, working on this uh, level, it will uh, uh, expand the uh, quantity of these people uh, dramatically and uh, uh, for example if uh, uh, you uh, will make a digital solution which will uh, help the people of the I know, hundreds of people everybody will be early uh, adapters for using these digital technologies so once again it's uh, uh, it's all about digital transformation in terms of uh, uh, organizational transformation and if your digital solution is useful uh, useful useful for uh, organization of course it will increase uh, the quantity of these adapters. I know I've heard some, you know, at many conferences we hear some great stories, you know, about a lot of companies that are deploying, you know, new technologies and getting, you know, maybe going outside. And I think you've done this at BP, Leanne, whereby you've got, you know, almost outside sources working on new and exciting events and then introducing them back yeah. in. What are you doing? I, I don't think it's technology necessarily that's the blocker um, here because um, many of the things that we need technology-wise exist already, right. and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. I do think, so when we look at our agenda in this space, we couple digital with agility and mindset because I think those three things need to happen at the same time to make this revolution and transformation in our industry. So the digital piece, I think we've made some great progress on. We coupled with an external Palo Alto based company to give all of our data to the hands of every single one of our petroleum engineers in the, f the format that they choose to have it in. And they're doing amazing things to add barrels of production by having access to that, that digital data. Um, if you look at the drilling space, which was my area for the last couple of decades, automation is a really, really big part of this industry's efficiency agenda. You know, you can see a future where drilling rigs don't need anybody at site and it can be fully automated and have downhole wired pipe, which we recently trialed in our Alaska business, coupled to closed loop control automated systems on our drilling rigs, which effectively mean that you can drill a rig from a mobile phone at some point in the future. So it's not that the technologies don't exist, it's having that mindset to say, how are we going to get there and how are we going to get there at pace as an industry? And I do think, I'm gonna be a little provocative here, that we are losing a little bit of discipline because of this price environment. I still think, and you know, we've heard some conversations over the last couple of days about ever expanding oil prices. We have to get away from that mindset as an industry because that's how we will get the mindset of true innovation. 
I don't know what the oil and gas price will be in the next couple of decades. I don't control it and therefore I shouldn't care about it. So I need an industry that is going to be more progressive, that is going to look at bringing the cost of producing oil and gas down year on year, irrespective of the oil price, because we don't control it, and bring in the technologies at pace to enable us to do that. And I don't think the technology is the blocker here. I think it's our mindset in our industry to do things faster than we're currently doing. And I see, I'm seeing great agreement on this one. <laughs> Um, Leanne, again, when you talk to your customers too, and you know you have the technology, you have a lot of these tools. Um, sorry, Jean May, um, we just Leanne has just answered that one for us. Um, again, what are you what are you hearing from the customers, and how can you make sure that a lot of this technology, you know, that everybody becomes a lot more agile? Because I think we can see that it works, and it's delivered some great results. So again, how do you get people on board, and how do you what do you do? as a company, you know, to shift the mindset as well? So it's, it's a push and a pull. I mean, all of our major customers have set targets, and we've heard from Leanne, and we, we've heard from Alexei what, what those targets are. Um, and so we are trying to be as responsive as we can to those targets and going very proactively uh, to our customers with solutions that are fit for those purposes. And where it has worked the best um, we've set up truly integrated teams where we have members of the, you know, the operator, members of our team working together to, first of all, quantify the carbon footprint across the value chain that we're both in, and then using that information to prioritize the most material areas on which to focus, and then agreeing from there, okay, what, do we, what can we do on those most material areas? Let's pilot those uh, solutions in particular parts of the world and then based on how well it works with an intention of scaling it up across, um, across all of the relevant operations. So that's a model that we've seen um, can work very, very well. Of course, it does rely on a few key conditions. So it does require leadership support from both sides to make sure that the right people are involved early on um, that people from you know all parts of the different organizations are involved, so that it's you know the buy-in is is there from the beginning, and uh, if you have that, and also an agreement on how you measure and how you not only measure the uh, carbon footprint reductions, but also how you quantify the business case uh, to make the improvements that you want to make. So if you have all of those conditions in place, then um, there's a great collaboration that we've seen is possible with, um, with our customers. Now there's a question here, and we're running short on time at this, but we've had a fascinating discussion here, and it keeps staying at the top here, so you voted it up at the top, so I guess I have to ask it. And again, it's that the public around the world demand a strong message from us, and is the Society of Petroleum Engineers ready to update its name to the Society of Energy Professionals? Now I was talking to Sammy actually about this earlier, um, and again, we don't have a representative, you know, and you're going to have to ask him and the committee about this. We don't have a representative particularly on the board here, even though we're, we're, we're members here. Um, and again, we talk many times about the Society of Professionals in Energy, without a doubt, and this very much of what you are. But what I'd like to ask, you know, you and the panel is, you know, how proud you are to be a petroleum engineer, or do you want to be seen as an energy engineer? Maybe Leanne, you want to take this, since you've been out there, and maybe Andre might look at this too, but, but personally, what does it mean to you to be an engineer? I, I was driving down the street in Calgary yesterday, and there was a big sign that said, I love oil and gas, <laughs> and let's be proud of our industry. And I, so I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna still be a bit contradictory here, I am so proud of being a petroleum engineer. I said I'm a chartered petroleum engineer. I only became chartered two years ago. It took me a while to, in my career to get there. And I'm super proud for all the reasons that we've talked about, lifting people out of um, poverty, being part of an industry that provides heat, light, and mobility to the world. I, I could not think after two decades in this industry what more I could have done to be prouder to be part of changing the world. 
Um, now that said, we do need to improve diversity and inclusion in our industry in its broadest sense. And inclusion, I think, has now become more important than diversity. We have a lot of diversity, but if people aren't included. And there are so many different professions that make up our industry. So I think it's an evolution. I think if, I don't know what the outcome will be if we want to talk about energy engineers than, than, than just petroleum engineers. If we want to talk about professionals than just engineers. I think that's all part of how inclusive this industry is becoming. And I think that's super important to our progression as an industry also. And again, I just want you all to now maybe think of this and then also to wrap this question up perhaps in terms of you know what you think are the big takeaways and what we need to do as an industry. So I know I'm only giving you about a minute to do it, so it's a sort of two for one on this. Andre? Uh, I think uh, what I'm really excited by is, is two things. The first one, now with solar and gas industry, it's uh, full of challenges, really interesting challenges. But uh, on, the, on the other hand, they have a lot of value in between the different uh, levels of uh, uh, of people, because uh, we have uh, a, a lot of uh, value in between service company and national oil company. We have a lot of uh, new value for in between uh, different disciplines, from geology to data scientists, etc. So I, I think the uh, collaboration of these challenges together with this new way of working, new way of mixing the existing technology is uh, very exciting. And personally, for me, I really like it. You're still with us, Jean May. I'll come back to you in a minute. Okay, sure. Um, well, I'll just say I'm not an engineer, so mm -hmm. I mean, I would be in favor of, of changing the name, but, uh, you know, it, that's just an aside. I, I really think, you know, what was said about diversity and inclusion, I mean, it's, it's diversity of thought. And the more we can bring perspectives from, obviously, across the industry, across the globe, but from outside the industry as well, the better off we'll be. I mean, we're seeing it in all of the you know, other stakeholders that are engaging in this debate. I mean, we need to find a way to build rapport with them and talk with them and make sure that we meet them at whatever starting point they're at and understand their perspectives. And that's what is the true meaning of diversity and inclusion. And I think sometimes, you know, because we are technical people, I'm an economist and I can be very technical from an economic standpoint, but we we tend to exclude by not being more layperson in the way that we speak about the industry and what we're trying to do. So we really need to make, I think, a much more concerted effort to meet broader society on their own terms. And that does require a humility um, that we don't know everything. And you can't just technical your way out of everything. Somebody made that point to me at a dinner recently, and it, I was really struck by that, that he said, the oil and gas industry has a tendency of thinking they can always just technical their way out. And we should take a pause and wonder, well, what is it that we're missing and try and embrace that as well? Because we'll always be technical. That's our strong point. But I think it comes back to, to what Liam was saying there. There's some fascinating stories in this industry. You all know them. You've all lived them. And there are going to be so many more. And we need to tell that well. Jackie, in terms of just wrapping this up to when we look at, you know, being in the petroleum industry, being oil and mm -hmm. gas players, being energy players, and again, what do we all need to do to make this better for everyone? Because ultimately, that's the big demand. Right. Well, first of all, I am a chemical engineer. I still have, I'm Canadian, a professional engineer, so I have my ring. So anyone that, <laughs> in Canada, that's an engineer likes to wear so this ring. So you know it, you have the, the and, right sign. Yeah, and I, uh, I took my MBA almost 20 years ago, and I had the first 10 years, well, Okay, maybe it was like 15 years ago. But first 10 years of my career was fairly technical. I wrote SP papers. I came and spoke at conferences in, in the little rooms and in the technical papers. And was, I've always been very, very proud to be an engineer. And that's why, although I'm not doing engineering anymore, I still wear this ring. Because we're problem solvers. I, don't, I think engineering is such a great career because everyone that I went to school with does something different. You can find your passion and you can, you've, you've been given the confidence to know you can solve any problem. You have the knowledge, the intellect, the background to do it. So I, I believe that this industry is going to innovate and reduce emissions faster than anyone thinks possible because of people like you. Um, and I think the industry is going to rise up to this challenge. And so I loved that video. So I haven't been to an SPA conference in many years, but that video you showed, that was amazing. I love the comments. Imagine if all emissions from oil and gas could be net zero. That was one of the comments made in that video. Mm -hmm. I want the SPA to put videos like this up 
you know, so the world can see um, what the people who are in the Society of Petroleum Engineering, and if you change your name to energy, um, I think that's great too, um, but what you're really thinking about and how ambitious your goals are. And I think the whole industry needs to get that way. If, if you're interested, the API is running some ads in the US right now. Just Google voice API and you'll see one of the ads. But, but it basically says we've done a lot, but we haven't done enough uh, and we need to do more. And uh, I think these messages from all these groups are so important. And I think I'll definitely re-echo that in terms of from what we've been hearing here and the great discussion we've had. I mean, I think we've seen, you know, four passionate industry key players here sharing their experience with you all. And again, from a company perspective, you know, just letting us know exactly what's going on. And a lot is going on. And many of you from different companies, you all know how hard you are working to make sure that things are shifting and that things are shifting in the right direction. And again, it's all about making sure that we have a sustainable industry. It's about building an industry for our future. It's about future-proofing that industry. And ultimately, the fact that we can do it, I think, by being environmentally sound, and actually the fact that it makes good economic sense. I think when we put all that together, we're certainly heading in the right direction. So I just want to thank my dear panel here, and thank you all you know, for your, your great ideas, for your expertise, for sharing that with us. So just before we finish up here, I just want to thank you all for doing that very much. To Jackie, to Andre, to Leanne, um, and to Jean May. Thank you so much. But now, before we just wrap up this morning, please join me and give a very, very warm welcome back on the stage here, the SPE 2019 president, Sami al Nuaim, And here he is. Sami, great to see you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Marty, uh, Ethni, and all of the, our panel uh, members. Uh, let me just say that uh, our name is the Society of Petroleum Engineers, and we are the Society of Professional in Energy, just to answer that question. I hope that uh, we learned as much as, uh, you know, I hope that you have uh, learned through this panel as much as I did. Many of our, uh, I just want to say that many of uh, our exhibits, uh, exhibitors are working on the important topic that we have discussed today. I encourage you all to go and meet with the exhibitors, talk with them about their technologies and services. I'd like also to highlight uh, a few of the changes that you will see during ATC this, this year. We are also holding our first unconventional theater where you can choose among several concurrent sessions. So be sure to bring your headphones and earbuds to listen to these world-class presentations on your phone via the ATCE app. You will also, uh, you, also need your earbuds to take full advantage of our knowledge sharing e-posters and the international student paper contest. Remember to download the ADC app now so you don't miss anything. The Canadian Society of Petroleum Geologists also is holding a workshop and two field trips on Thursday, October 3rd. These specialized events will give attendees an opportunity to explore Alberta's hydrocarbon history and geology on a much deeper level. They sound fascinating. Lunch will be available on the exhibit floor each day of the conference. On Wednesday, also, uh, Wednesday morning, the Calgary section is hosting a special pancake breakfast on the exhibit floor. I have heard Canada is known for its great maple syrup, so I am eager to try some of myself. Be sure to join me, to join me uh, on, on uh, Wednesday. As I said earlier, ATCE is all about innovation. I am sure you will find many things that can solve your challenge at work and inspire you more towards something new and different. It is all about one of the components of SPE mission, and that is to collect, disseminate, and exchange technical knowledge. And don't forget to visit Petrobol, which is already underway. It is always exciting, I tell you. It's exciting to watch the university students, our future workforce, compete. I encourage you to make the most of your time at ATCE. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the opening general session. Please share ideas and follow the discussion in this session on Twitter using the hashtag ATCE2019. Please enjoy the rest of the conference.